This is where I step in. Nice. Level up. Yes. I love me level up. Just letting the ink dry. We do it my way. Victories in combat and other advances will award your characters with experience points. After gaining a certain amount of experience, a character will achieve a level up. This allows them to gain a new class or increase their level in one of their taken classes. This also provides other benefits such as increasing the character's total hit points. Yeah, dude. You're going to quick save. You're going to save before level up. Wait, before level up to level two. I'm gonna try and save before I level up my characters each time. I'm losing my temper. Okay. Obviously, we're going to go with Fighter again. What do we get at 2? Another bonus combat feat. Burst Barrier. Second level of Tower Shield Specialist. Use his shield to screen himself from burst spells and effects, gaining a plus 1 bonus on reflex saves against them while employing a Tower Shield. This bonus increases by one by plus 1 for every 4 levels, after 2nd to a maximum of plus 5 at 18th level. Whoa! Whoa! Next. Alright, so we have more skills points. I want to be good with words. A plus one, that's actually not not worth it. Let's do perception. Let's not do perception. Let's keep it the same. Use magic device. No, we use magic device. Perception. Go ahead and do mobility. So I'm going to get both of my tanks. What is. Uh, you gain plus one bonus on all attack rolls. Okay, no. Uh, we're going to do. Whenever you are adjacent to an ally who also has his feet, you receive a plus two confidence bonus to your combat maneuver defense. This bonus increases to plus four if the creature attempting to attempting the maneuver is larger than both you and your ally. Combat maneuver defense. Every character has a CMD that represents their ability to resist combat maneuvers. A character CMD is determined. What is a combat maneuver, though? Um, a creature can also add to its CMD any bonuses to its AC based on circumstance, deflection, dodge, insight, luck, morale, and profane, and sacred bonuses. Uh, 
Any penalties to a creature's AC also apply to its CMD. A flat-footed creature does not add its dexterity bonus to its CMD. The size modifier for a creature's combat maneuver bonus is as follows. CMD equals 10, plus base attack bonus, plus strength modifier, plus dexterity modifier, plus size modifier, plus miscellaneous modifiers. But what does CMD do, though? Like, does it add to my AC? So confused on it. I'm gonna look this up really quickly. Pathfinder, Kingmaker, Combat. Uh, like, what is considered a combat maneuver, though? Like, combat maneuvers. During combat, you can attempt to perform a number of maneuvers that can hinder or even cripple your foe, including bull rush, disarm, grapple, overrun, sunder, and trip. Although these maneuvers have vastly different results, they all use a similar mechanic to determine success. Okay, so a combat maneuver is basically like a... Um... Like, like, like using something to hinder, basically, physically to hinder your enemy physically that would explain all of these if you're fighting something that's huge they have a plus two or if they use it sorry if they try and use a combat maneuver to you like if they just Say they try and grapple me, I have a plus two against it. Okay, that's not like actually super important right now. Um... Uh, combat mobility, I guess. What is this? Whenever you are wielding a shield and are adjacent to an ally wielding a shield who also has his feet, the AC bonus from your shield increases depending on the shield wielded by your ally. Uh, if your ally is wielding a heavy shield or a tower shield, your shield bonus is increased. 
increases by two. Here's what I want. Shield wall. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. And I'll give Valerie that so we'll be extra tanky on the front lines. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, give you perception. Persuasion, mobility. Shield. Wall. I like it, dude. I like it. I like it. This is great. We will be untouchable. Keep you as bird. Keep you as bird. Put two into perception because we're going to keep you very perceptive. You're barred, so I think persuasion plus eight is pretty good. Um, yeah, Bardic knowledge. A bard talent. As a bard gains experience, she learns a number of talents that aid her and confound her foes. The second level, a bard gains a rogue talent. As a rogue class feature of the same name. At sixth level and every four levels thereafter, the bard gains an additional rogue talent. A bard cannot select a rogue talent that modifies the sneak attack ability. Character with this talent has a cast iron stomach or has trained themselves to withstand poisons, especially ingested ones. They gain a plus one bonus on all saves against poisons, as well as a plus four bonus on saves against all spells and effects. Is this a castable? Can I cast this on somebody? Uh, this ability allows a character to move at full speed using a stealth skill without penalty. Here, this looks as talent gains a bonus combat feat. A character with this talent makes a perception check, they gain a plus four bonus. We'll go Iron Guts, I kind of like that. Part Knowledge. All right, spell. So we have a damaging ability that also dazes. We have cure light wounds. Let's do something that's completely Reese. That's so helpful. Super helpful. Yeah, we're going with Grease. CCs, baby. We need that. We are in dire need of some CCs.
change shirt. Knowledge world. Perception. Persuasion. Okay. Rage power. As a barbarian gains levels, she learns to use her rage in new ways. Starting at second level, a barbarian gains a rage power. She gains another rage power for every two levels of barbarian attained after second level. A barbarian gains the benefits of rage powers only while raging. And some of these powers require the Barbarian to take an action first. Unless otherwise noted, a Barbarian cannot select an individual power more than once. Um... We're going to go lethal, I think. He gains a plus one competence bonus on melee attack rolls and thrown weapon attack rolls. Um, I like Reckless, but I hate the negative one penalty to AC. To be quite honest. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Wait a minute. Oh, I already get lethal stance at level two. Wait. Oh. You have got to be kidding me. I can't believe I just did that, man. Oh. <laughs> Alright, I guess I gotta... Oh, I guess I gotta speed through this a little bit. I don't remember what I used. Shield wall complete. I think that's right. Shield wall. Um.
Give her some mobility. Iron guts. Grease. Complete. Barbarian. That's weird. Why does it show it twice at the end? That was weird. Hmm. Why does it show it twice? Oh, one's an acquired ability and then one's just the ability. <laughs> okay, then. Then we do a save. After level up to level three. Exclamation mark. Save. Hi. Hello, sir. Take that, you scoundrels. Oleg shakes his fist, but now he scratches his head and stares at the ground gloomily. The girl got away, a plague on her. She's certain to complain to the Stag Lord. They came before to collect taxes. This time, they'll come to punish treason. Now what are we to do? He sighs heavily. If only I could set, send Svetlana somewhere safe and show those rats what's what. He notices a fair-haired woman approach. Dove, why are you here? I told you to stay hidden. It's all over. I saw it. I just needed to be sure you were all right. The woman looks at her husband tenderly. If with a hint of sorrow, Oleg mumbles something as he looks away, embarrassed. My name is Svetlana. I'm sure your arrival to our trading post turned out so unwelcoming. Tell me more about yourselves. Oleg shifts uncomfortably. Surely there are more important things to discuss. Well, alright. We're just honest people who came here from Restov. We fixed up the old fort to house travelers and give merchants a place to trade with the locals. We also deal with the occasional huntsmen in the area. What does any of this matter? When those bandits come back, they'll either drain us dry or just kill us. I saw someone run out of the trading post. Do you know who it was? That must have been Boken. He sells potions. He lives out in the forest like a hermit. But he comes here every day. He knows every tree and bush in the area and how they can help you. The Stag Lord's gang wants him to work for them. He lacks the courage to fight those bandits. But he won't just walk away from us. He has a good heart, even if he grumbles a lot, especially recently. Let's get to the point. You say the bandits are going to attack again. Who are they and will, uh, when will they arrive? Oleg waves his hand sullenly. Who are they? They are the Stag Lord's gang. That's who. These lands team with bandits like bedbugs in a beggar's hut. And you just stirred them up. They have a camp not too far from here. I expect they'll return in full force in half a day, maybe less. The Stag Lord won't take an, in, uh, an insult like this lightly, and his henchmen are more like demons than men. They claimed they were collecting taxes. Why? For the Stag Lord and his cronies, of course. That Stag Lord fancies himself a king in these parts. You may have antlers for a crown, but all the troublemakers around here are happy to follow his orders, as long as they're paid. So they, cha they charge an arm and a leg as taxes, and they call their executions punishment for treason. 
even those who never swore allegiance to the Stag Lord. They're killed fast. If they're lucky, if not, Oleg looks at Tisvetlana. Dov, why don't you go start supper while we finish our talk? I've no need to be protected from dark talk. I'm not some blind kitten, you know. I've seen what they do to people. Svetlana lowers her head. Most of the gang is made up of simple bandits. Um, but there are a few monsters among the leadership, especially those close to the Stag Lord. Ox and Dovan um, from Nisrok come to mind. They like to make a show of their tortures and executions. My husband and I, we saw the bodies. Tell me as much as you know. How many bandits are there? What do they want? What do they want? Those bloodsuckers think they own this land. They come, take what they want, and steal the better part of our money every month as a toll for their leader. They even broke our gates so we couldn't try to hide anything from them. No one knows exactly how many there are. Sometimes only five or six come. Sometimes it's a whole gang. I'd have shown them what for long ago if not for uh Svetlana. You have nothing to fear. I'll help you deal with the attack. Well, I appreciate your good intentions. I may not have the best manners, but Oleg Levitin is the last name you'll hear accused of being ungrateful. If we manage to defend the post, I'll reward you proper. We have to hide, Svetlana. Please don't argue, Dove. Now, we also need to decide on a plan. Go ahead and look around. There may be some tools that can be used for battle. There are some pretty solid traps around, some tar, and a box of uh, alchemist fire, looks like. Alchemist fire? We could put it by the gate, light it off with a burning arrow when those bandits are nearby. That could set the post on fire, Oleg shouts surprised. Well, maybe if we covered the walls with something to protect them. Alright, yes. I think it could work. I'll even shoot the arrow myself. I used to be pretty good with a crossbow back in my day. Answer a few more questions. Enough to talk about bandits. Uh, I'd like to see your goods. Don't know what good trading will serve if those bloodsuckers come back and take everything, but alright, have a look. Well, I'm just... We seem to have stirred up a hornet's nest. The fight at the trading post only made the bandits angry, and soon a whole gang will be here. Jamandi Aldori made it clear that keeping this trading post safe is one of the conditions for receiving the Baron's title, so we have to protect this place and its people no matter what it takes. Okay. It's a cooking ingredient. Uh, 
520. Perfect. Got a grand already. Beautiful. I could buy I could buy half plate. And I'm gonna the Maria can wear these. Doesn't help you. It's not gonna help you at all. Already checked. Well, what the hell? I don't know if I should sell this. I'll hold on to it, I guess. Just, just in case. Notice some good steel traps in the box. Is the stuff that's if the, is the stuff outlined in white going to be stuff we can use against the bandits? Because that would be bad arse. Nice, we're succeeding at all our checks too. Definitely. We need all the help we can get. We do it my way. Wait. Onwards. Onwards. These bandits are going to get the what for, just like he always says. We should talk to Bakken too before we continue. We do it my way. The old well has been renovated and cleaned. It even has a new roof.
A frail, disheveled old man wearing a stained and tattered robe gives you a gloomy look. I'm Buckin, local herbalist. What brings you here? Tell me about yourself. What is that to tell? I'm an herbalist. Make potions and sell them. Gather herbs, roots, berries. <sighs> Buckin sighs. I live in the forest. Live off of the land. Since leaving Restov for these uh, parts, I ended up a merchant here at Oleg and Svetlana's post. They let me out in the ki uh, out of ki they let me in out of kindness. Help me with things. They bring me water or firewood when it's cold, and the occasional barrel of honey. They're good people. We could use you uh, when we fight the bandits. Where's this coming from? You want an old uh, old man like me to fight? Here, take this potion. Consider that my help. Wow. Fine. Wait. We can diplomacy, and we might be able to get it. The bandits here bother you as much as they bother Svetlana and Oleg. Maybe more. Help us get rid of them for good. Succeeded! Yes. Walken scratches his head, then hums to himself and puffs his chest out. Well, all right. I'll show those troublemakers. They'll learn better than to chase an old man around. Someone might even write up some verses about me. Maybe even heroic ones. Lindsay gives you a worried glance, then turns to Bakken. Please be careful. Go ahead and help, but leave the heroics to us, you hear? We'll talk later. Head on! Couple more things to sell. We okay. do it my way. Do a full save before we enter this here fight. I'm prepared for the attack. Get in your positions and wait. Fear not, I'll stand between you and this scum. You're under my protection. Mir flexes her shoulders. Finally, a fight. I was bored with all that talking. Well, these aren't the heroics I was hoping to write about. But I guess even the greatest heroes had had to start somewhere. I see you're not easily cowed. I beg you, be careful. And please, don't let Oleg do anything too risky. Svetlana, go inside. Go hide inside. We're going to meet our guests. Six hours, almost seven hours passed. Wow. Oh, there's more here. Okay. Okay, so. I'm not going to have you. Wait, I don't need to be enraged. Or she doesn't need to be enraged for that, so that that's good. Um, and come and come right there. And can you can you Ooh, ooh, get wrecked. I see. Um... You know what? You're gonna...
I assume I don't need to worry about this grease anymore, or maybe I do. That was a bad placement of Greece. That's my bad. That isn't going to work. Serves you right. She doesn't have a ranged weapon. Snaps. She's done. Yikes. Onwards. My character is stuck on the ground. I am your shield. Nice, a cape. What you want? I gotta be better about the placement of the grease, man. Done with waiting. Until she gets back up, give it, give, give her a second, give her a second. She'll come around. There we go. Do a full save there. Oleg is breathing heavily, but he shakes his fists in the air menacingly. You rats got what you deserved. Now they'll know better to treat honest people like cattle. And our Bakken here taught them a thing or two as well. Now, my lord, head up, uh, head on up to the guest rooms on the second floor. You deserve some rest after such a battle. I need to clean, uh, clean things up. A hundred gold coins, nice. And this is for your efforts. Now don't offend me by trying to turn it down. Just take it. An honest fight deserves an honest reward. If that were more common practice in this world, I think life would be so much better. I just want to see. Am I on challenging? How do I know? I am on challenging. Okay. I won't be halted. Wait, let me talk to Boken. To Bot Balkan. We sure showed them what's what. Yeah, we did. They didn't stand a chance. Oh, 
I'm glad it's all over, even if there was a fight. We'll talk tomorrow once I finished working. We do it my way. Is this our stash? I'm sorry. I'm listening. Sag. Guide for Travelers, Hunters, and Explorers of the River Kingdoms, Volume 5, Monsters and Beasts. Will-O-Wisp, an amusing glowing ball which looks harmless and doesn't arouse any natural suspicion, pretends to be a guiding light in the marshes but leads travelers to a certain death. The agonizing fear of their victims is this monster's nourishing dinner. If you manage to resist their tricks, make sure you have some electrical protection. The monster electrocutes any visitors it fails to lure into terror. Werewolves. Prefer to hunt in groups and attack lone travelers. It's entirely possible that a Ver Verizian camp or a troop could turn into a pack of bloodthirsty Lincolnthropes under cover of darkness. Ordinary weapons stand a little chance against them, but a silver blade greatly increases your chances of survival. Primals. Powerful creatures of the primal realm occasionally visit this world for amusement. It's best to stay out of a primal's way. Don't fight it. It's extremely dangerous. But if a life is at stake, resort to cold steel. Cute little kitty. Uh, the touched creature becomes invisible for a short time. If a check is required, an invisible creature has a plus 20 bonus on its stealth checks. Nice. Uh, you must see the range touches attack. Hmm. Ah, awesome. Uh, okay. Sleepy time. You wake up from a nasty dream that tortured you almost all night long. In it, you saw a wall of unnaturally thick fog that surrounded you. Slowly moving closer and closer, a quick look out of the window, and you find out that the fog was not a figment of your imagination, not a dream, and then... Hear me. Please hear me. Can you hear me? Please. The half-transparent outline of a beautiful nymph appears before you. Even in this ghostly form, it's clear that she's exhausted, her shoulders are slouched, and her large blue eyes burn within the, her pale face. Her voice is barely more than a whisper as she reaches towards you. Guardian of the Bloom. It, it seems that only you can see or hear the nymph. Who are you? Who am I? Just a tear. Shed by the land itself, the bitter sigh of nature. I am a nymph, the guardian of this area, a defeated guardian. Call me the guardian of the bloom, if you wish. What do you want from me? Aid, salvation. We have a common enemy, and long have I searched for someone who can defeat him. The one you call the Stag Lord. As a storm strikes ruthlessly with gusts and lightning, the Stag Lord wreaks havoc with the swords of his servants. And not just in the world of people. The land also suffers from the evil he brings. My forests and my flowers suffocate in this fog. Soon even I will vanish as the last ray of light fades at dusk. 
The stag lord is responsible for the fog? Yes. It hides his fortress as well as his dark deeds. But while responsible, he did not create this affliction. It is the work of a powerful druid who has betrayed even himself. I know not why the powers did not leave this renegade, but even I was unable to defeat him. How can I help you? This fog. It enshrouds, entangles, suffocates. If only I could learn how it was created. But my powers wane. I have barely the strength to call out to you. All I know for certain is that somewhere in this forest lies an old house. And it echoes with the remnants of a strange power. The Stag Lord and his druid were there. The fog hides this place from me, but I can point you to the bandits' camp near the Thornford. Make them tell you where this place is. Go there and listen to the echo. Catch the whispers. Search for anything that can tell you how the fog was created. Once the fog clears, nature will breathe again, and you will be able to easily find your way to the fortress of our mutual enemy. Thorn Ford has been revealed. Gained 45 experience. I'm glad my adventure begins with such a beautiful sight. Beauty is so tender. It can so easily be crushed under the blows of cruel fate. But you can save it from being undone. Sparks light up and fade in the nymph's huge eyes. All right, I understand. Farewell. I don't believe in fate, stranger. But our meeting seems more than a coincidence. The nymph's whisper fades as she disappears. Stolen light. Safe location. There are no threats in this location. It is a sort of headquarters where you can prepare your party for a new... Uh, for a new expedition. In such locations, companions don't follow you around and will go about their own business. You can speak with them freely to get to know them better. Once you exit this location and return to the global map, you'll, you uh, will be able to choose the companions you wish to take with you, leaving the others here. Whenever you meet a new companion but don't want to include them in your party right away, that companion will travel to this location on their own. Nice. A halfling girl with toast, tussled hair, wearing a dusty traveler's outfit, sits chewing the tip of her quill. Just a moment, how should I put this? Oh, I know. She scribbles something quickly in a notebook, scrawled with verse, raised her eyes and gives you a bright smile. Oh, hi. Uh, tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? Where are you from? I'm from all over. Ha ha! I was actually born in Galt. A nation of free thinkers and radicals renowned for its brilliant uh, poets, artists, and philosophers whose ideas shaped the politics of the whole of Avistan. Galt was once a vassal nation of Cheliax. Uh, after the death of Arodin and the rise of House Thrun the Ch uh, in Chiliax, the people of Galt decided to throw off their foreign rulers along with their own nobles who had colluded with them. The executions did not end with the bloodshed, and within five years, the severed heads of the mi uh, ministers of the first government rolled down the steps of, of the guillotine. Wow. <laughs> uh, in the 40 years since, over a dozen governments have ruled Galt, rising and falling like the waves of a stormy sea. In such a tiny village that is not even uh, on the maps, if it weren't for my teacher, I'd still be living there, milking goats, weeding turnips, swilling homebrew, having babies, and using uh, books only as kindling. Who is your teacher? He's a true saint. He was once an important person in the capital at the Church of Shillin, but he got in trouble with the authorities. 
and went on a self-imposed exile to the tiniest, most godforsaken priestless village he could find. The one where I was born. He wanted to open a school, but the villagers wouldn't let him. You can heal us all you like, but no putting any ideas into our children's heads. It'll only distract them from their work. But he did, te uh, but he did teach me on the sly. He taught me how to read, how to write. And he gave me books, poems, legends. Uh, he was the... He was the one who told me about the Ark Knights of Avastan, and when I told him I was going on a journey, he gave me a magic ring so that Shellen would protect me from harm. Hmm, haven't seen him since I ran away from home. I hope he's alright. I ask Shellen every day to grant him a long life and new students. Ark Knights of Avastan, who are they? Oh, you haven't heard of them. How can you be here without knowing one of the most epic stories in the history of stories? They? No. I won't spoil anything. You should just read about them yourself, every single chapter. Their adventures are what gave me the idea of going on a heroic quest and writing about it to begin with. And now look at me. Here I am on a heroic quest. <laughs> How did you become a bard? When I realized there was nothing for me at home besides more radish uh, patches, I decided to run away. A traveling book peddler, Tessie the Quill, happened to cross our village. While well, I stuck to her like, uh, like a burr, and wouldn't let go until she agreed to take me as an apprentice. Together we traveled everywhere, to Brevoy, and Taldor, and even Ustalav. And when I found out about the Academy of Grand Arts in Patax, and I thought, well, I love reading stories, so I can surely learn to write them too. I enrolled on my first try, and they even gave me a scholarship. Then they expelled me. Ha ha! But that's okay. They'd already taught me all the important stuff, and now... With Shaylin's help, I can manage on my own. Taldor, the mighty emperor, uh, empire of Taldor, once stretched from the Arcadian Ocean to the border of the Padisha Empire of Kilesh. Or Aradin himself was said to walk among the people of Talador, and his religion, a shining beacon uh, unto the world, radiated outward from Talador's gilded capital of Opara, uh, Taldor's ancient armies of exploration established footholds for the Empire throughout Galerion and its mighty uh, phalanxes marched for thousands of miles during the Shining Crusade to beat back the Whispering Tyrant. Now, Taldor is a stunted remnant of its old glory, having lost control of its daughter territories and, it, and is almost ignored by the powerful countries of today which assume it will continue its slow decline for at least another century. Ustalav, the immortal principa wow. the immortal principality principality did I say that right? Of Ustalav is a fog shrouded nation of countless horrors and a once proud realm that suffered under the clawed lands of the whispering tyrant of for centuries. Academy of Grand Arts while not as popular as some of the great bardic schools of the inner sea, Patax's Academy of Grand Arts still manages to attract some students seeking greater specialization. Do you worship Shellen? Yes, not to offend the other gods, but she is the most important of them all. All the other gods guard the world as it is, but only the eternal Rose, the goddess of beauty, calls us to the world as it should be. Read that. Why are your clothes so messy? <laughs> Lindsay waves her hand carelessly. Forget it. I can't waste money on looks. I'd rather buy books instead. In a hundred years, when people are reading my works, they aren't going to ask whether the author had holes in their shells and their sleeves. Fair enough. You come from Patax, right? Tell me about it. Oh, I love Patax, even though they kicked me out. A joyful place. What is life in Patax like? Actually, Patax has always been one of uh, one huge nest of thieves. Bandits, river pirates, smugglers, fences, hard, hard sharps. Always been home for the likes of them. But that was before Iravedi became king. With him, a whole different life began. Iravedi... Ir Ir uh, Always wanted to make history, but not as another bandit with a crown. Though that's exactly what he is. 
He wanted to be glorified through the centuries as a great patron of arts, so he built the Academy of Grand Arts and spent lots of gold to assemble the best artists, poets, and musicians. Of course, the very best ones refused to go, but he got what he wanted in a way. If Patax was once just a booze barn for thieves, now it's a carburet. What do you know of King Aravetti? He won his crown in a game of cards, which says much about Patax as it does about him. He fiendishly clever, or he's fiendishly clever. Some cheats I know told me that from the moment he appeared, he started to pulling off such schemes that the old city masters just scratched their heads with him in charge. Gold flooded into Patax, and also he's incredibly unimaginably fantastically decad decadent and conceited. Getting drunk with whores at the pub, that's not Lord Aravetti style, oh no, he aims higher, dressing up like a male Calistria. <laughs> with a golden codpiece, and holding a three week orgy. <laughs> with dancing on the rooftops, parades, public executions, and a contest for the best ode to the great unrivaled king. That's more like it. He also likes singing. And he orders his guards to make citizens gather for his shows. May Shelley have mercy on his listeners. And we have the Academy. You know, jokes aside, I'm thankful for Irvetti for building it, but he has no taste at all whatsoever. He likes his art loud, bright, grandoy, uh, and most importantly, glorifying his royal highness. He kicked out the best charcoal artist because he didn't wish to spend money on grace gribbles. He sacked a masterful flute player from Tian uh, Xia for playing too quietly, and instead ordered them to open a kettle drum class. He even he even ordered the academy to expel me, and for what? An innocent uh, limerick. Would you go back to the academy and finish your studies? I'd like to return, but on one condition. If they threw out three quarters of the professors who teach there now, and returned all the ones they banished. If you ask me, I'm proud to have been expelled, if my art was to Irovetti's liking, then I would have reason to be ashamed. Tell me about the book you're writing. What is there to tell? You've seen some of my rough drafts already, haven't you? It's a book about you and your adventures. I am writing the whole truth, just as it happened. Well, the whole artistic truth, you know, no glory, no story. What's the point? Uh, even I was at the academy, Eobald the Insightful began his literature course with the question, what is a person? And he answered, a person is a storytelling animal. Our world does not consist of things. All these woods, seas, and cities, it consists of stories about those things. The stories to, uh, we tell to ourselves and to each other. Just think about it. Centuries will pass and there will be no me and no you. All your subjects will be long gone. But you and I will live on people's memories and influence their deeds thanks to this very book. No offense, but your command of language is not that good. The truth doesn't hurt me. Who do you think my most severe critic is? That's right, it's me. This is my first real book, and I have yet uh I have much yet to learn. But don't you worry, I will do your feats justice. And if I put my foot in my mouth here and there, then we can print a second edition, revised and corrected. Your book is full of inconsistencies. Yes, I can admit that. Sometimes, sometimes uh, one has to bend a few details for the sake of dramatic effect. It's called Poetic Truth. I read everything as if I'd seen it with my own eyes. Every, uh, even parts of the adventure that I wasn't around for. But I do always carefully question everyone who was with you at the time. Think of it as a general picture. In the end, you're the hero of this book and I'm just a storyteller. So what kind of character am I? In books, everything is simple. These are the heroes and those are the villains. In life, of course, it's completely different. You have to make difficult decisions and I don't always agree with you, but that's what makes you a complex, multifactored character, multifaceted character. You have an iron core, no matter what tricks fate throws at you in your path you always know what's right and what's wrong some might say that's boring but others learn from you and your strong character yeah how do you feel about me reading your work in progress well these are only drafts but of course you're welcome to read them just keep in mind that even if you don't like what i read about i won't change a single letter 
Don't even ask. Of course, it's a book about you, but it's a book. Of, uh, but it's my book. Understood? The small Reg's eyes glow rebelliously. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll be remembered for my deeds, not for your... No, that's kind of... That's too mean. As long as you write the truth, I have no objection. I swear, Lindsay puts her little hand over her heart. Truth, only truth, and just a teensy bit of imagina imaginative exaggeration. Tell me about your friendship with Tessie the Quill. What's there to say? The books woke my urge to travel, but it was only thanks to Tessie that I managed to really get out of my village. At first, Tessie tried in vain to get rid of me, but later when I told her I was staying in Patak, she even shed a tear. I wonder where she is now. What's to do with the ring you always wear on your finger? Ah, uh, this. Lindsay holds her, arm for, uh, holds her arm for you to get a clear view of the ring. It was a gift from me, from my first teacher. It's magical, imbued by powers of Shillin, no less. Uh, when I get myself in trouble, it transports me to a safe spot. So, please don't get angry at me if I said disappear from a fight. I'll wait for you here. Promise. I have to go. Just don't leave without me. Of course, uh, I should just write whatever you tell me. But if I wanted to stay cooped up in a dusty room, I'd still be sleeping through lectures at the academy. The elf looks straight at you through the tangled hair falling over her face. Hey, you're the advent uh you're an adventurer, right? Taking your fortune in the stolen lands. You aren't the only one of your kind here. Take my advice. Keep your eyes open and watch your back. Sometimes the ones who call themselves your friends are more dangerous than your enemies. Judging you by the elf's voice, it's obvious that she started the day with a jug of wine. Who are you? The elf grunts. Honorial eight eyes. Once upon a time, I was famous throughout Absalom, Honorial Eight Eyes of the Reckless Six. Well, glory passes quickly, a few miserable decades later, and no one recognizes you on the street anymore. What a shame. Absalom. For more than 4,000 years, Absalom has been the city at the center of the world, a metropolis-sized showcase of the greatest treasures in all of Galarion. The city not only holds a key strategic position for both commercial and military endeavors in the region, but encompasses the site of the ascension of four deities and claims to have been founded by none other than the last Aslanti, the god of Arodin. Eh, pretty cool. What's your purpose? I sit here waiting for adventurers who are in need of help. We may be sitting here in the Backwoods Tavern, but in Absalom I have a lot of friends who are eager to make a uh, few coins. They have brave hearts, but shallow pockets. A little gold would be a welcome change for them. I can send them a message, and they will come from Absalom through a portal. If you're interested, just give me a sign, and we'll arrange everything right away. Uh, so, th so this is how you create your own characters. This is this 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 is just how you create your own characters. Where were you when the trading post was attacked? I was hunting, got a little lost in the mist. Uh, which is the first time that happened to me. I guess I should go easier on the drink. But don't you imagine I'd be scared of a good fight? If only I'd known. I'll see, uh, but I see you've got everything under control. Why are you called Eight Eyes? Once long ago, I could spot an enemy and pin him to the wall before he could even think of attacking. Some said I had Eight Eyes and looked all around at once. Though it seems I've outlived my nickname. And Ariel stretches her arm forward. Her palm trembles noticeably. I've been drinking so much lately. It's best I don't test my skills too often. <laughs> Would you like to join me? Oh, no. I've got enough things to do already. You'd better manage on your own. 
A famous pathfinder. You're in the middle of nowhere. Why? You want to know how one could exchange the life of a pathfinder for this sorry drunken rat hole? The light in Anoriel's eyes go out as if someone had blown out a candle. You lose all your friends because of one scumbag, and then you'll understand. I was the only one to return from the final campaign of the Reckless Six. And whatever is left to me can't be called a seeker anymore. Anoriel remains silent for a long time, as if wondering if she wishes to poke the old wound. Here's a story. Our leader, Varmelt, was the best of us. Wise, brave, friends with everyone. One of those friends, Adivian Adrissant, sent him a disturbing letter. He stumbled upon mention of some ancient books in the or on the art of necromancy. Secrets like those are best left hidden forever. Trust me, I've seen what that kind of magic can do. The elf bites her lip. To make a long story short, these volumes were supposedly hidden in the catacombs of Gallowspire. We decided that the book should be retrieved and kept safe by the society. We gathered in a tavern, discussed the expedition, then proceeded to Ustalov. Uh, it was a normal mission. A quick and quiet recovery, and Oriel smiles bitterly, but everything turned out to be much more complicated. We barely made it through the Witch Gate Forest. All those terrible living trees and dead druids and their arcs of bone. It was a miracle we managed to make it out alive. Pathfinder Society is a globe-spanning organization based, on, based out of Absalom. The membership consists primarily of Pathfinders adventurers who travel through Galerion, usually inconspicuously. Uh, and explore, delve, and otherwise experience the lesser seen parts of the world. They send journals documenting their travels back to their venture captains, who also assign them new missions and suggest new places to explore. The most exciting and illuminating of these journals are compiled in the Pathfinder Chronicles, an ongoing series of books and collections uh, of the history and mystery of the Golarion for its membership in the general public. Um, we chose in Wren Church to stop at. It was marked on Vermelt's map as a safe enough haven to hole up and, and lick our wounds. How oh, I wish I, that had been true. Vermelt was the first to perish. He was attacked by one of the monsters hiding in the stables. It tossed him like a feather and threw him down an ancient well. His shout echoed for a long time. And I didn't hear the sound of him landing. And then, Anoria pauses and turns away, hiding her eyes. Enough, I shouldn't have gone into this. Who am I to disturb others' feelings with all my chatter? We'd better forget about it for now. Maybe I'll tell you some other time, but not today. Regarding your story. What happened in Renchurch? I have no wish to fill your sleep with nightmares. When you prove that you can stand firm in battle, that you can achieve victory without losing yourself along the way, then I will tell you the horrors of what waited us. Okay. She wants poof. That we good. She wants poof. What's the purpose? To school adventurers, we search for those who are eager to test their skills, and we educate them and give them ideas about where on Golarion they might seek their fortune. They look for forgotten knowledge, secrets, and lost artifacts. They are explorers and pathfinders. We are a sort of mutual assistance club for adventure lovers. We exchange experience, share knowledge, and keep careful records in case it proves useful to the future expeditions. And also, we publish books to thrill seeker for thrill seekers and bored urban teenagers from wealthy families. Um, all sorts of adventures. We have representatives from all races, religions, and beliefs. The Grand Lodge is in Absalom, but there are many small lodges throughout Galerion, and the venture captains direct pathfinders to their goals from across the corners of the world. Who does the society support? You mean, who does it serve? No one in particular. Pathfinders try not to get involved in quarrels of others. Uh, they serve only the spirit of adventure, and sometimes they happen to save the world. However, that doesn't mean there are no black sheep among the seekers.
Okay. Interesting. Do, 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 do. So much lore. We're gonna talk, Amiri <laughs> utters a weary sigh. All right, spill it, I'm listening. We're just talking, you don't like it? Amiri shrugs several times, press flexing her muscles, or maybe just filling in the silence. Don't know, she admits at last. Depending on what we're gonna talk about, if it's about monsters or swords or scars, I approve. That's good. And if you're gonna ask questions like why and what for and how, screw this. Mary looks at you over slowly, head to toe, or you've got even harder ones. Tell me about yourself. Um, the simple question is, there's a puzzle, Amiri. Uh, she scratches her head, then starts counting on her fingers. First, I'm a barbarian. I'm strong. Um, I grew up in the realm of the Mammoth Lords. I left my tribe, the Six Bears. Amiri looks thoughtfully at her four fingers and shrugs. I like fights, she concludes, bending her thumb. Uh, a realm of megafauna, inhabited by humans, almost as savage as prehistoric beasts surrounding them. The realm of mammoth lords is a land in Avistan's far north that is home to the myriad nomadic tribes of Kelid barbarians. What is it like to be a barbarian in the Six Bears tribes? Ha! Our people are big and strong. We, we can cut a monster in half with one swing. We can walk three days and nights with no rest. We can eat a whole fried, uh, a whole fried aurochs. Guess you had a lot of training to become as strong as you are. Training? Ha ha ha! No one freaking trained me. The boys of the six bears got the training. All I could do was watch Amiri's eyes gleam with anger. And you know what? They were still crap even after all that training because I kicked their butts hard. Animals, bandits, monsters, all thought they were stronger than me, idiots. Amiri spits on the ground, because if you start a fight, you think you can win. You think you can, uh, you think you're stronger than your enemy. Amiri raises her chin proudly. I defeated them all. See all the scars on my face? What does the realm of mammoth lords look like? Huge and freezing, no place for weaklings. Mary, uh, Miri narrows her eyes as if evaluating your ability to survive her homeland. Tribes haunt, uh, tribes hunt Arox herds to survive. Arox are fast, so tribe fellows herd for days. Just not to die of hunger. If you are weak, you stay behind and die in the snow. Tribe cannot stop. Also, there are giants and mammoths. Sometimes demons come too. Ah, and the mastodons and the saber-toothed tigers, Amiri grins. You would survive, I think, for a few days. Why did you leave? Because uh, they were assholes, all of them. Men were cowards and scoundrels, and women were scared like sheep. And Mary rolls her bloodshot eyes in fury. Men think they uh, think no girl can be a fighter because they are weak. They are afraid of a woman can. Uh, they're afraid a woman can beat them. And females just nod, go sue hides, cook meat, watch kids. That's what they always say. But I'm a warrior, damn it! I won't cook hides and watch meat. Amiri is already shouting her fist clenched tightly. <laughs> I told them so. I went hunting with men, and what I did get still the same. You are a woman. You stay home. You even gave me a nickname, the Soft Chieftain, like a warrior woman was a funny joke. Damn, I even went to hunt those shit-faced frost giants, and there, there, Amiri suddenly stops breathing heavily, sweat beating on her forehead. After a moment, Amiri waves her hand awkwardly and forces herself to grin. So I left. Cowards, scoundrels, and sissies they were. That's why. Quite a good fighter. Good. Quite good, huh? Compared to who? If I was a scrappy male, I'd fight better. Is that what you say? She glares at you, her eyes narrow. Or you say I could be better. Like, go get some training, Amiri, right?
You are very good in a fight. You're an excellent warrior. I've just given you a compliment, that's all. For several seconds, America does a glare. She faces suspicion, then all of a sudden she mellows. True, I fight good. That's what I do best. You're rather rude, you know? You bet. Amiri grins, then suddenly frowns. I'm a fighter, big and strong. Everyone's afraid of me. I can't play the softy. Who would ever fear me then? <laughs> the contemplative expression just appears from Amiri's face, replaced with, by a dreamy grin. I enjoy being feared. When I pass by all the sissies, almost faint. Knees trembling, teeth chattering, shit dripping down their pants. Amiri falls silent, fascinated with the picture of her imagination is created. Okie dokie. So why did you leave your tribe? What's the story about the frost giants? I told you already, they were assholes. They treat women like sheep, not fighters. As for giants, I'll tell you later. Someday, maybe. That's a formidable sword. But it's not just a simple weapon, is it? You bet it's not simple. Check out how big it is. She proudly raises the blade, and you notice that even though Amiri is extremely strong, she still has difficulty wielding such a large sword. This sword belonged to a real blasted frost giant. I killed the beast and took this looker for myself. Fits me perfect, my damn trophy. Amiri's eyes flash uh, with menace as if she's challenging some invisible enemy to try taking away her trophy. Uh, thanks for talking with me, let's speak again later. Talking, talking. When will we do some monster killing instead? True, true. Greetings. Valerie sighs. Everything is well, I hope. I'm ready for new orders. Tell me about yourself. What exactly would you like to know? I was born into a noble family. Though I didn't remain long on the family estate, my father sent me to the Order of the Eternal Rose, but I left once I realized that I didn't match my that it didn't match my principles. Where are you from? What was your childhood like? I was born in Brevoy, but in fact, I've never seen much of the country. I spent my childhood on a remote estate. Uh, my father is a respectable philanthropist and benefactor of the Church of Schillen. He's also a renowned private collector and a great admirer of the arts. My mother saw to my education personally. From my early years, I learned good manners. How to behave at a dinner table, the proper form of words, and every occasion. I also learned the difference between nobles and lowborn upstarts. And I learned how to treat peop each of them properly. Our home was always under the protection of several paladins of Shellen. My father has donated a handsome sum to their order. One of them, a man of venerable age, with a grey beard, once let me touch his shining armor. I still remember the admiration I felt when I touched the cold polished steel, Valerie smiles. Of all memories of my childhood, that one is somehow the warmest. Why were you sent to the paladin order of the Eternal Rose? As you can imagine, from my first days, I was surrounded by crowds of servants and nannies who never stopped praising my heavenly beauty. The paladins of Shellen who used to visit our house echoed these praises. In the end, general consensus overwhelmed my father's better judgment. When I turned six, I was brought to the church of Selen, uh, Shellen and told that this would be my new home. Don't pity me, though, I beg of you. Many who hear the story immediately assume that my parents were cruel and had no love for their child. Valerie's eyes become stern. My parents had respect for me. They taught me something that has supported me all my life, a sense of self-esteem. Besides, they didn't abandon me. Once every six months, they would come and visit me at the Order. We had some tea and then had an hour to talk and walk around the garden. Uh, then they would take their leave, as etiquette demanded. What did they teach you in the Order? A variety of things. Some of them appealed to me, others I simply couldn't ex uh, accept. 
I enjoyed the physical activities and swordsmanship, but the arts, calligraphy, painting, poetry, and so many other ways to waste one's time. Valerie sighs. I guess that deep in my heart, I always knew I'd never be a true paladin of Shellen. Wielding a sword always felt more natural to me than handling a paintbrush. Fair enough. Uh, why did you leave the order? Because of my heavenly beauty, Valerie winces in contempt. According to Shellen's laws, all art is sacred. Whatever form it takes, severe punishment awaits those who dare harm a painting, sculpture, or poem, no matter how worthless the drivel might be. My looks always attracted unwanted attention from the pilgrims and acolytes at the temple. I received my first poem dedicated to me when I was nine. The author was some wealthy geezer, Valerie's lips thin in contempt. And that was you know, the only the beginning. Sculptures, pictures, poems, I was drowning in them. My admirers mobbed me, and I had to respectfully accept all their garbage. The clerics of the temple were magne magne magnanimous, or my suitors made generous offerings to the church. But once, one time, I just snapped. Barely suppressed anger glitters across Valerie's eyes. Some wealthy idiot has dedicated an extremely untalented poem to me. He had the nerve to read it to my face, holding my sleeve. The hour was late, and I was on my way to get some rest after a boring lesson on rhymes. I lost control and tore the poem apart right in front of him. Valerie raises her head proudly. The paladins wanted to impose some punishment upon me. I don't remember which one exactly. They wanted me to, <laughs> they wanted me to repent. Instead, I just gathered my things and left. What did you do after you left? Set off for Restov. Valerie shrugs. Wanted to get as far as way uh, as possible from Shellen. And the destiny everyone seems so ready to force upon me. Besides, the school of swordsmanship in Restov has quite the decent reputation. Honestly, I was hoping for an opportunity to learn from the famous Aldori masters. Eventually, it became clear that their technique wasn't uh, a good fit for me. They teach to avoid impact, whereas I prefer to raise my shield. Me too. But my abilities and skills, which I'd learned at the Order of the Eternal Rose, were enough to make the Swordlands, uh, Sword Lords take an interest in me. They offered me a chance to join the mercenaries who served the Sword Lords, and I accepted. The bitch of beauty inspired many people, the Order. Valerie's gaze suddenly becomes cold, and here I'd hope to avoid the question. She exhales, loud, uh, exhales loudly. Well, let's get this over with, one for all. You should understand I'm perfectly aware that most races, orders, and genders find me physically attractive. It's beyond my power to change that, but I've never given a, a potential admirer any reason to start conversation with me, but it doesn't stop them. After leaving the order, I took a dagger and cut off the long hair um, they used to praise. Well, now I get letters praising the beauty in my eyes. It was because of my appearance that I ended up in the Order of the Eternal Rose, though I never wanted to be a paladin. It was because of my beauty that an infinite number of suitors have pursued me, all of them confusing simple politeness with hints of affection. Valerie clenches her fists. But do you know what I really want? I want people to stop treating me like a piece of art. I want them to notice that I'm a person, that I'm capable of something more than smiling for paintings. Where I sit wearing a lacy satin dress, holding a basket of peaches in my lap. Is that too much to ask? The last question comes out as a shout, though Valerie doesn't seem to realize it. Thank you for your honesty. I understand you very well. You are a true friend who I can trust with my life. I am truly happy that you understand me. Thank you. Valerie smiles at you gratefully, and the smile is full of a warmth that you never expected from someone as stern as Valerie. You suddenly realize that you're smiling back at her. Tell me about the way of Shellen and about her paladins. Uh, Shellen is a goddess of love and beauty and art. Her paladins are something like armored artists. That's how they like to think of themselves, at least. Valerie tries to contain her feelings, but her inner contempt bursts forth. 
There are fanatical defenders of worthless and artistic paintings and meaningless opposes. Um, if you care to know my opinion. You speak of Shellen with such contempt. What did the goddess be do to earn your anger? You're trying to ruin my life. The goddess of everything useless <laughs> that ever existed in this life. All the beauty in the world, all the art, all the soulful size of the moonlight. They'll never feed a single family. And I beg you to restrain yourself from offering your own opinion. Trust me, I've heard everything you can tell me. More than once, nothing and nobody can change your mind. Valia looks at you with suspicion. Um, I almost joined her prosperous entourage. I'm just glad I was smart enough to denounce her while I still could. What do paladins do? They wander around seeking the next pile of garbage. Uh, and when they find it, they call it an immortal piece of art and admire it until they're blue in the face. You might not believe this, but the paladins of Shellen aren't allowed to slay their enemies if they beg for mercy. Can you guess why? Because a bandit rapist or murderer who has been put to the sword will never be able to create something beautiful in the future. So a paladin overpowers her enemy in battle and inspires him to create a masterpiece. Valerie's face reflects extreme disgust. It might sound hilarious if it weren't true. Plus, all of Shellen's followers are obliged to practice some sort of art in his or her free time. Every single day, no matter what else is going on, even if you're feeling sick or hungry or sleepy. Otherwise, according to their clerics, you lose connection with your goddess. A preposterous notion. Wouldn't you agree? I understand that not every piece of art is good or even decent, but surely there must be at least a few great works among them. Is that what you think? Valerie cribs an eyebrow, mocking amazement. Many share that delusion. I was deluded too, for a while. Now, I consider all works of art useless. People create this garbage because they have nothing better to do. The peasant doesn't paint a picture. He plows the earth to feed his family. The soldier has no time for sculpture. He must defend his homeland, but idlers and slackers have plenty of time to waste, so they smear canvases with paint and imagine they've done something worthy and valuable. Well, he shakes her head in disapproval. You said every pound must practice some kind of art. What kind did you pursue? Ah, that. I used uh, to embroider. And I still do from time to time. A treacherous blush covers Valerie's cheeks. It's nothing, I assure you. Just a simple task to keep my hands busy and keep the gloomy thoughts at bay. Nothing special. So you're an atheist. You don't worship any deity? Right. I need no guidance from above. I have my own good conscience and my leader's orders to live by. You know, you don't have to follow etiquette and maintain good manners while speaking with me if you don't want to. I'm aware of that. Valerie sighs. But I'm sure you don't understand that I am what I am. That's how I was brought up. First by my parents and then by my mentors in the order. Besides, I was born of a noble family. Valerie raises her chin proudly. So I rather enjoy the idea that my manner of speech differs a bit from the common language of the peasantry. You just can't imagine how many social climbers have bowed politely the moment I open my mouth. I guess you have plenty of suitors. <laughs> Valerie rolls her eyes. Sally, you're right to suppose that. Even here in these remote lands, one can find offspring of so many noble houses. And all of them consider it their duty to kneel before me, begging me to walk with them in the garden. Valerie's voice overflows with contempt. If words were poison, you'd be dying a horrible death. Oh, and don't forget about the village oafs. They understand the concept of nobili uh, nobility perfectly well. So they realize they'll be punished if they dare make any advance towards me. So they prefer to stare from a distance drooling. And believe me, I can very well imagine what they discuss in the taverns. Valerie shivers and jerks her shoulders as if trying to shed the sticky, disgusting stares. You know, you really are quite beautiful. You're a reliable friend and a worthy ally. It would be a crime to ignore your beauty? No. So you're going to follow my orders. Why? What do you mean, why? Oh, he looks at you in bewilderment. I follow your orders. I've joined your campaign because I have faith in you. I believe your intentions are noble. Though things may not always turn out as you planned. You are, you are my commander. Your orders are law. It's my duty to follow them. Valerie hesitates for a moment. Well, so long as you don't order me to do something that is absolutely dishonorable. 
But that would never happen, I hope. Okay, you know, you really are quite beautiful. You're a reliable friend and a worthy ally, but it would be a crime to ignore your beauty. Gives you a stony look. I sincerely hope your words carry nothing more than mere politeness. Well, yes, that's what I meant. That is good. In that case, I thank you for the compliment and would ask that you never bring up the subject again. <laughs> I think it would be better if you leave. <laughs> oh, man. No, no. Thank you for the conversation. Talk to you later. As you wish, Valerie nods with dignity.